Okay, thank you. We're going to get started. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Deputy Mayor Jennifer McAlvey. I am chair of the budget subcommittee that is here today. We have quorum, so I'll call our meeting to order. Welcome everyone. Although we are meeting on different location, at different locations today, the budget committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Though I am not a person of African descent, I am committed to continually acting in support of and in solidarity with the black communities, seeking freedom and reparative justice in light of the history and ongoing legacy of slavery that continues to impact black communities in Canada. As part of this commitment, I would also like to acknowledge that not all people came to these lands as migrants and settlers. Specifically, I wish to acknowledge those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly those brought to these lands as a result of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. In support of the City of Toronto's ongoing efforts to confront anti-black racism, I pay tribute to those ancestors of African origin and descent. Today's meeting is being held in the Scarborough Civic Centre. Members of the public who are registered to speak today are participating by video conference on WebEx and are also in the room. Today's meeting is stream li sorry, streaming live on YouTube and the link can be found at toronto.ca slash council. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Uh, seeing none, uh, we will Oh, there's no minutes to approve, that's right. Uh, we'll move to uh, the next portion. So this is a meeting of a subcommittee of the budget committee. So today you have Deputy Mayor Morley, myself, and Councillor Chang, who are members of the two subcommittees um, for budget that is happening today. So there's also a committee that's meeting elsewhere today as well. Our colleagues on budget committee, uh, Councillor Shelley Carroll, Councillor Perks, and Councillor Moyes are meeting to hear public speakers right now at City Hall. The subcommittee will hear registered public speakers today at 1.30 and then again at 6 o'clock. The city clerk has posted the speakers list online at toronto.ca slash council. And uh, if you'd like to see the list, please uh, click on, on the top and you'll see the list of names. For those who are registered to speak today, here's how our process works. We have some speakers in person and some online. If you're online, the video conference host will activate your microphone and will turn on your video if you like. I will call each name on the list in order, and then you will have five minutes to speak to the budget committee. After you speak, please stay with us because members of the committee may want to ask you questions. After your speaking time, you can stay connected and listen uh, to the rest of the meeting on YouTube if you like. Uh, the, cl the clerk has also received emails and communications from the public about the 2024 budgets. Those communications are being made available to members on CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. I encourage the public to send their comments to the budget committee through the budget process by emailing buc at toronto.ca. This is the public's opportunity to speak about the budget. This is also our opportunity to consider your comments before we make recommendations. Budget committee will meet again on Friday, January 26th for our wrap up meeting and we'll make our recommendations to the mayor and to city council. Okay, so we are going to move a motion that is housekeeping to close the speakers list. As you know, the speakers list was closed already once it hit 30 people and they were informed of that, but we procedurally have to do this. Uh, so I now move that the speakers list be closed. No further registration is allowed as the speakers lists are full. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. Okay, so I'm gonna call out uh, the names in three just so that whoever's next can get ready and we can try to transition smoothly between the different speakers. So up first is John Mason with Friends of the Guild Park. We then have Santosh Gupta, followed by Emmy Ma with the Toronto Environment Alliance. So John Mason, you're up first, you have five minutes.
sorry, should I start again? Yes. Okay, do I, I, I need to start again? Uh, you, can because I forgot. you can start again because I forgot to start your timer. So either way, <laughs> you go ahead. All right. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, good afternoon. My name is John Mason, president of Friends of Guild Park. Thanks for including us in today's proceedings. I'm highlighting the urgent need for better funding at Guild Park and Gardens in Ward 24. Conditions at Guild Park today don't align with city policies and best practices. The hundreds of thousands of Torontonians who visit the site simply aren't well served. There, there's a way to improve Guild Park without more city funding. I'll explain more and, and ask the committee for support to that approach. As an intro, Guild Park and Gardens is a city park that covers 88 acres of parkland, forest, and lakeshore along Scarborough Bluffs. Friends of Guild Park is an award-winning not-for-profit. We've successfully collaborated with Guild Park officials for more than a decade. We appreciate how the city has made major investments in Guild Park since 2015. It created three assets, the new Clark Center for the Arts, the restored Sculptor's Cabin, and the rebuilt Guild Inn. Previously, these were all vacant and falling apart, which was why so few people visited the park. City funds transformed Guild Park into a four-season destination, where visitors enjoy its nature and unique historic features. But past investments overlooked public washrooms. I can sum up conditions today with just two numbers. The total number of park visitors, 200,000. The total number of permanent washrooms, two. To be clear, the Parks Division provides just two permanent public washrooms for Guild Park's 200,000 uh, year-round visitors. This is a big washroom deficit, and it was never meant to happen. In 2018, PFR said it was a high priority to build more washrooms on site. Those priorities changed last spring, when officials withdrew all the money for the new washrooms and postponed the entire project until 2028. Visitors tell us today that city facilities on site are embarrassing, especially compared to what the city provides at High Park, Canoe Landing, and other public sites. People also wonder why city policies that encourage consistent levels of accessibility and services across Toronto don't seem to apply to this popular park in Scarborough. Regarding the arts, the city identifies Guild Park as an important cultural hotspot in East Toronto. Each summer, thousands attend uh, arts activities at the park's historic Greek theater, weekend festivals, outdoor plays, and city events, such as arts in the park. But Guild Park can't fulfill its larger arts mandate without attention. Last year, a city-sponsored festival came for the first time. The director found the site was so poorly suited for performers and audiences that the festival won't return until things improve. We know the city can do better, and that's why Ward 24 Councillor Paul Ainsley is working for more on-site washrooms. We strongly support Councillor Ainsley's efforts. The last point is how to improve Guild Park with no new funding. We support allocating funds that the city is earning at Guild Park for Guild Park. The money is from the city's 40-year lease with Guild Park's private event center. By agreement, the city gets part of the center's annual revenue. Officials tell us that last year, revenue surpassed $6 million and the city share is about 10% or $600,000. This is a significant amount. Mayor Chow and other stakeholders are interested in how this existing revenue stream can directly benefit Guild Park. We ask the committee to support such an appropriate and sustainable approach to funding Guild Park. It maximizes the city's $10 million investment in the site. It also allows Guild Park to operate as an even better city asset, a spectacular place where art meets nature for all Torontonians. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for a deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining thank us. Our next speaker is Santosh Gupta, followed by Emma Ma, followed by John Stapleton. Do we have Santosh in the room? 
online. Okay, our next speaker is Emma Ma with Toronto Environment Alliance. You have five minutes. Good afternoon, members of the Budget Committee. My name is M.A. Ma, and I'm the Dr Toronto Environmental Alliance's Executive Director. When I joined T five years ago, my first time representing the organization was giving a budget deputation in this room. And for the first time in five years, I'm a little bit hopeful when it comes to the city budget process. I have observed real leadership from City Hall in confronting Toronto's long-running financial crisis, bringing other levels of government to the negotiating table, and making a real effort to have a meaningful public discourse on the city budget. I am here to make an appeal for a funding a climate-friendly, healthy, equitable, and resilient Toronto. We can only more move towards this vision if the city uses its revenue powers while continuing to negotiate with other levels of government to take up their responsibilities. For Budget 2024, raising property taxes is the most important financial tool that the city has to address the climate crisis and other critical responsibilities that must be funded through the city's core revenue base. The net zero transform TO climate strategy cannot be treated as a special project that the city can resource with piecemeal funding. We will never achieve the transformative climate action that Toronto has committed to unless we fund the strategy on the same basis and as part of other core priorities. As such, we're calling for deep multi-year investments in the following. Ensuring that all city initiatives and partnerships to increase Toronto's affordable and deeply affordable housing stock include resources to build to the highest green standard tier and make these homes climate safe and healthy as possible. We must not miss the opportunity to build the 65,000 city-led units in the housing strategy right the first time. Increasing funding to the MIRA program and ensuring that buildings acquired through MIRA are eligible for grants to improve energy efficiency and receive support to qualify for additional green building funding. The city should establish a green retrofit fund for MIRA. Funding reliable, affordable, and accessible public transit that serves every corner of our city to ensure ridership continues to grow. The city must include funding for groundwork to build a Scarborough busway in budget 2024 in order to give Scarborough residents a much better option than slow, crowded shuttle buses. Investing in frontline community-centered responses to keep residents safe during extreme weather. We saw the terrible tragedy that unfolded as a result of the BC heat dome. We must do everything we can to prevent this from happening in Toronto. Community volunteers, agencies, hubs, as well as city divisions need the resources to prepare for extreme weather events, build community frontline response capacity, and protect the residents made most vulnerable. Given the critical importance of these intersectional and interrelated actions and investments, I want to express concern about presenting climate action as something that is ranked against other important city priorities for increasing or decreasing funding in the city's consultations. In the context of an affordability crisis where many folks are just trying to get by, we cannot expect that residents are going to rank climate action above other priorities. We are being asked to make untenable choices and I can't imagine that anyone would really choose to divert resources away from preventing harm to their own or their family's health, safety, property, or livelihoods during a flood or heat wave, for example. I further understand that after years of keeping property taxes artificially low and other orders of government downloading responsibilities and underfunding Toronto, we are at a juncture where difficult choices need to be made. As the budget draft stands, raising property taxes by at least 10.5% is the only responsible choice that City Council can make. This increase will cost the average household an additional $35 per month, and the City is providing an income-based relief program. Essentially, it asks for those with means to contribute a little more and able to keep our city running. In the context of intergenerational housing, affordability, and climate crises, the least we can do is urge residents and members of council to support this essential measure. We must also keep driving towards other interim and long-term financial solutions for our growing city. We applaud the city's ability to, bring, to secure an agreement from the province, but this is not a transformative new deal. This is the beginning of what the province must do to compensate Toronto for removing important revenue sources and chronically underfunding our city. Lastly, the federal government has access to far more powerful funding tools than the city, 
and must come to the table with a long-term revenue solution. The federal government must immediately take up its responsibility for supporting refugees and walk the talk when it comes to climate action by making transformative investments in our transit system and greening our buildings. I would like to conclude by thanking the city staff for their hard work in preparing Budget 2024 and call on members of council to be courageous in the face of these difficult times. A city that is able to care for and create opportunities for those made most vulnerable, welcome refugees and prepare for the climate challenges that lie ahead, lies ahead is a city that will be better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you. And I'll just remind the audience, we have to do jazz hands when we're in committee to express, there you go, our happiness with things. Um, okay, uh, our next speaker is John Stapleton, followed by Noor Mohammed Kazi, followed by Daniel McIntosh. Uh, John, thanks for joining us, you have five minutes. Thank you, do I have to touch this or am I on? It sounds like you're on. Okay. Is he on? Thanks, councillors, for this important opportunity. I'm here to talk about multi-tenant housing and how it relates to the budget. We have an existing array of housing that is becoming more expensive. I'm talking about single rooms and shared rooms. Um, in Scarborough, a single room uh, that is a shared room goes for $650 to $800 a month. In 2018, that low point was $450. It doesn't work now that Ontario Works single rate that hasn't been changed is 733 a month and ODSP is 1,308. Low income private market renters are especially vulnerable and when they become homeless, they become more expensive and that's a budget issue. Rent control is very limited as you know and multi-tenant homeowners who have collected cash rents in other words, the worst operators can sell and pocket large unearned and untaxed capital gains based on the fiction of sole owner occupied dwelling. And I've seen this happen, so it's important. Public housing has been stalled for over 40 years and we know that um, Northern Scarborough is only one sixth density for subsidized housing. We could implement citywide rent controls, introduce a new rent registry, raise incomes of low income residents, encourage more multi-tenant housing by raising the cap on the number of rooms from six, because some of them are not gonna be viable at six, and we know that. Also review the sale of supposed owner-occupied sale of home with no record of tenancy and i.e. history of cash rental payments with no receipts or written records. These are the people who say, will say they are living in their owner-occupied dwelling and then sell if the heat on them becomes too um, difficult for them. We could also increase amenity density in Scarborough. So what's this got to do with the budget? The budget summary, we got 22.3 million for 42 staff, 8 million and 24 for enforcement and administration of licensing system and communication with landlords, 1.6 million for 24 building staff. We have 2 million for 16 fire inspectors by the end of 2025, 2 million for landlords to support building rentals and cost for variance applications to support a total of 80, 80 rooms. Two, another 2 million is allocated for 2025, but zero is allocated for tenant education, increased support to prevent eviction, and support for displaced tenants. So, my comment, Toronto's most affordable housing is the housing we already have. Let's keep people where they're living now. Bertrand Russell once said, there's two ways to, to deal with the problem. You can avoid it or solve it, and he said it's always best to avoid it, and we can avoid these problems. The city's multi-tenant housing policies, in particular the six-room cap, puts these homes at risk. We anticipate that many multi-tenant housing landlords will sell their houses rather than undertake many re reservations, and this is what's gonna cause the problem. Toronto is reaching a tipping point where the lowest income tenants, newcomers, seniors, students, low wage earners, and those receiving social assistance, that's Ontario Works and ODSP, will be displaced at the very time we are losing this valuable stock. My overall comment is displacement, displacement, displacement. Let's worry about it, let's do something about it. We cannot afford to lose affordable housing faster than we create it. To reverse this ominous trend, we need to do four things. Consult with tenants before the rollout of the new system 
tenants are the number one stakeholders in the multi-tenant housing policy. They're getting zero from the budget. Budget for tenant education to ensure all monthly tenant housing, under, housing um, people who reside there understand their rights. Remove the six room caps, as I said, because for some they're only viable at, at eight or nine. And substantially increase the supports available to tenants who are displaced, including assistance with housing, search, and rent subsidies. Thanks very much. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Um, I just have a quick question. The numbers you pulled, were they from the budget notes that were um, published on the Toronto Budget 2024 website? Yes. Okay. I will follow up on that because I believe in many cases it's the additional investment this year. So I will ask about the tenant education piece because it may be that there is a budget, but because it started last year, this budget's the same this year. So often... And sorry, did you know that? Because I have to make it as a question. So um, did you know that I will follow up on that um, to confirm that that is, is there? Yes, thanks. I mean, I read it and I read it as zero. So yes, the follow up would be. Correct. So and did you know that if that is the case, there were additional officers added last year. So then this year is the the plus two million. So it could be significantly more we're spending. It's just often reported as the change over last year. So let me look into that. Um, and did you know, I know how to get back to you. Yes. Okay, great. But also the, the important hydraulic is the tougher we are on the operators and especially good operators who want to do the right thing. Uh, the incentive to, to cash out is high and displacement could be a real problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any other questions Thanks. to the deputant? Okay, thank you. Our next deputant is uh, Noor Mohammed Kazi, followed by Daniel McIntosh, followed by James Golding. Thanks for joining us, Noor. When you're ready up here, just make sure the microphone's on and you have five minutes. Good afternoon, members of the budget committee. My, I, I am, I am Noor Muhammad Kazi, and I am an immigrant. But in Canada, I am living thirty years, and now I understand that I can talk something, I can, I can speak something. And this is on immigration policies. So immigration policy, now big criticism everywhere. There are lots of immigrants. The immigrants people also say, yeah, why this government is taking too much immigrant in this country? There is no answer. Nobody explain it. So this is the budget. It is now the immigrant and the refugee uh, question in the city is very much burning issue. And uh, the tussle with the, uh, the federal government and provincial government and city government is going on. And if they cannot share with this big budget, it will be then disaster for the, the economic hardcore city, this Toronto. Without the economic vibrant policy of the Toronto city or its budget or its leadership, is not so stronger enough. The Canadian policy, Canadian reputation, all over the world is a good country, peaceful country. It is a livable country. It will not go further. It will not proceed further. There will be a big frustration. Being, a, being an immigrant, my life and my family life, I understand that how much struggle an immigrant uh, family or children can face. 
So what happened, the question is, there are two mass immigrants. This has been answered in the, that is the environment the campaign. They, they give some scenario. They said the, uh, the, so the, this campaign is suggest, the research campaign, that 44% of the Canadians agree with the statement that there is Thomas immigrant, Thomas refugees. But disagreement 51% on this question, that there is 51% they are disagreement. So 44% they are agree that uh, too much. And the, the, with fifth, it was happened last year's, the, this same campaign is survey, there's Immigrant is, though it's the very much essential for the immigrant population in this country. It is a country of population. This, con this city also, 50 up percent are immigrant, this, this city. So, uh, so I think that last year it has been shipped from the result last year where the same question had a record high up 69% of people disagreeing with the statement, with 20% saying there's, there are too much immigrants, only 27 last year. But this year, uh, the, the 60, uh, the, that, uh, so 69% agree that, uh, there, that there, there, there should be uh, the uh, immigrant uh, in this country. So the things happen that now the climax of the situation is here, this immigrant and non-immigrant po population. And I think that here the budget can be accommodate with this city without the accommodation of the federal, provincial, and the cities uh, but the uh, city's councillors who are working hard, we appreciate only 25, 25 councillors there before it was the 40 for a 50. Thank hour. you. So thank you. I think I like to express what I like to express I have done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Uh, okay. Are there questions of the deputy? Don't run yet. Are any questions? Okay. Thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is Daniel uh, McIntosh, followed by James Golding, followed by Scott Harrison. Daniel, thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Please make sure the microphone's turned on there. Hello. Hi. Um, there's a lot in this budget to be happy about, and I'm excited about a lot of the items that have been included in this budget. Uh, credit where credit is due. I'm super impressed with the funding for much needed shelter space and affordable housing the expansion of com the community crisis service and enough funding to maintain and even grow a little TTC service levels, despite the loss of COVID relief funding. However, as a frequent transit user living near Scarborough Town Center, there's one thing that I'm disappointed to see absent from this budget. There's currently no funding for converting the old Scarborough RT into, into a dedicated busway, as was recommended by the TTC staff as, a replacement, as part of the replacement plan. The Scarborough Town Center to Kennedy Station Transit Corridor is an, an essential transit corridor, not just for my community here around Scarborough Town Center, but for all of Scarborough. If you're taking a trip downtown by transit, for most trips, for most people in Scarborough, there's a good chance that, that trip will be on this corridor. Pre-pandemic, approximately one in eight of all trips in all of Scarborough were on the Scarborough RT. For thousands of people in Scarborough who rely on public transit every day, every year this corridor gets delayed, means they lose an extra 80 hours of their life sitting on public transit. You can see behind me is an invoice for, uh, to city council for nearly 
500,000 total hours of lost time and counting, signed by Scarborough Transit riders. We were told this busway could start construction in 2023 as soon as Line 3 shut down, and now we're being told we'll have to wait until 2025. We can't wait months while negotiation for the pro with the province for funding is underway. We need to fund this now and avoid further delays. We can ask for reimbursement from the province later. The city has made a commitment to achieve net zero by 2040, and that will, will require a strong public transit service to support high ridership levels. We need to make sure public transit remains a viable option for people in Scarborough so we don't lose ridership while the Scarborough suburb extension is getting built. During Mayor Chow's election campaign, she promised to ensure funding for this busway, one way or another. Scarborough listened and played a big part in her election win. Now it's time to make good on that promise. I'm very aware we're already looking at the largest property tax increase since amalgamation. However, I have yet to hear anyone who relies on public transit complain about a property tax increase being used to fund better public transit. While I sympathize with the homeowners on fixed incomes who look at this property ta tax increase and already worry about how much it will cost them, I would encourage them to take public transit more often. If you save just a single tank of gas by taking public transit, it will easily offset the extra $40 per year that would be required to pay for this busway. The whole reason we're in this place to begin with, staring down a 9% property tax increase, is because property tax rates haven't kept pace with inflation, never mind keeping up with the increased costs of a growing city. Let's not continue that mistake. This is a project that is overdue for funding and urgently needed. We can't wait any longer. And since I have a little more time, I'll add that I would like to see greater, greater, a greater increase in TTC service levels. The city continues to grow extraordinarily rapidly and we need to ensure TTC service levels keep up. The TTC is planning future service levels based on standing room only. That is not good enough. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Oh, look, I love the jazz hands. Good, good job. Um, not clapping. Okay, uh, next speaker is James Golding, followed by Scott Harrison, followed by Philip Paratishu. James Golding. Thank you for joining us. When you're set up there, you have five minutes, and please make sure the microphone's on. Thank you. Can you hear me? Of course. I'm a person with a disability. This budget's going to affect me, and eventually I'll be out in the street. A lot of people will be out in the street. I have a problem with the 6% and the 10.5%. The first thing I want to discuss was I have two ideas for funding in Canada. We did something in 1975 and it worked. We created an Olympic lottery and it went to support Olympic athletes. I think it's something that this city and the country should look into. Also, why can't somebody send a letter to all homeowners and ask them if they have room in their home to help house refugees and homeless people? We're getting kicked out of shelters because of her policy, we're, 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 gonna, we're getting hurt and we're dying. My uncle was a victim of that. 6%, she said she spent $200 million. How did we get to 250? And take an extra money. And how do you turn Immigration Canada into a city fund? How do you do that? You can't sever Immigration Canada and make it your own in a city. You've gone over the heads of the federal government. You told them, too bad, I'm doing it. Then you extort the city and tell them, if they don't pay, you pay. What kind of society are we live in? We know we need funding for people. It's there, stop spending it. How do you kick 4,000 people in this city, out the door. I noticed in the newest budget, the 1.5%, the 1.5 billion, it dropped from 1.8. You're still at 10.5. Why is that still 10.5? The number should come down. The 6%, you took funds out of an account, you spent it, and you kept spending and spending and spending. 
You cut 97 more million from the federal government. You spent it and spent it. $397 million was spent in 2023 on refugees alone. My problem with that is they're still in shelters. The cost for shelters right now has been lowered by over $100 million. The funding seems to be for an account, and it's not for the city. It's for her. She wanted 6% when she was running for vacant property tax. How did we get this 6%? She came in here with a spending spree, and it cost us. Do you understand the effects that this is going to take across Canada? If you implement the 6% period, that means every single city can now say, I can do the same to my city. We won't need immigration in the federal government because it's in municipal. It's in municipal. You took the job from the federal government and made it your job in a city. The funding doesn't come from municipal tax. It comes from federal. And so those who pay federal taxes, what are you spending your money on? Why are you wasting that money? Use the ideas. The Olympic lottery worked, and it worked for a lot of people across Canada. It was a national lottery. It brought in a lot of money. I have the numbers. I've done the work. How do you take that much money out and only spend 200 and build a city for 50 more? I don't get it. We need to help each other. I'm here for every single person in the city and in the country. We need to stop this because it's going to have a hard effect. She has a stipulation in a response to refugees. Read it. I thought it was a Rogers contract. I swear to God, because it says cost estimates are subject to change. She's going to do it every year. Increase, increase. Increase, increase. Final thought. Suffer. Well, she puts it in her bank. God damn. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Thank you for joining not. us. Our next speaker is Scott Harrison, followed by Philip Panatishu, followed by Paul Beatty. Hello, Scott. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Please make sure the mic is turned on. Thank you. Are we on? Sounds like it. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Scott Harrison. I'm the son of late Metro Councillor Brian Harrison, who's also a former city councillor and had been a budget chief of Scarborough during his time. Our Mayor Chow talked about a modest tax increase during her election campaign. A 10 to 16.5% is not modest. This compared to the CPI index at 4.4% increase, the pensioners have received on their CPP and OAS pensions. More like 5 to 6% would be a modest increase. Therefore, I propose the following suggestions to help you solve the problem. Eliminate the partnership with the Toronto York Labour Council that only allows limited approved organization to build on city projects. This will, allow more than, this will then allow more unionized companies to bid on labour projects in the city. This has been reported at a savings between 350 to 400 million annually. Eliminate the Toronto police officer pay duties at construction sites around the city. This will save hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe more, on construction-related projects in the city. These savings could then be used to help support the police budget. Other cities and towns don't use police for these projects, just security guards or on-site construction personnel. I stood in front of the budget committee over 10 years ago to get support for an increase in outdoor rinks in Scarborough a more equitable service to serve the residents of Scarborough as compared to the rest of the city with 52 outdoor rinks. Since then, you have increased by one outdoor rink. We now have two. I'm suggesting that you now eliminate approximately 45 outdoor rinks across the city, a more equitable service. This is a saving to the city, uh, this for a savings to the city to keep two outdoor rinks in other areas like Toronto East York, North York York, Etobicoke, and Scarborough at two. 
Scarborough, uh, Scarborough residents wouldn't be affected by this. Since this city has eliminated certain services like leaf vacuuming for Scarborough Etobicoke, and now talking about the Winthrow uh, plowing, citing a more equitable service throughout the city. Phase in the privatized garbage collection east of Young Street, similar to Etobicoke, as this has been talked about in the past as a saving to the city, as in some previous reports. Reintroduce user fees to all Rec and Park program, i.e. swimming, skating, and lessons, like other GTA cities. I know for a fact that the residents from Durham, Markham, Mississauga use our services for free. We are the taxpayers, not them. Youth pleasure skating and pickering cost approximately $4 per person. In my youth in the city, I recall paying for these services, and now as a taxpayer, I'm suggesting that we ask for payment once again. The free ride is over. Other things like library and overdue fees should be also reinduced. Thank you at this time. And if you want a map of the outdoor rinks. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is Philip Penetishu, followed by Paul Beatty, followed by Chris Langenfeld. Thank you. You have five minutes. Please make sure the mic's turned on. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. I'm speaking with TTC Riders Advocacy Group for Transit. Uh, my name is Philip Panaitescu, uh, and as a student in uh, Scarborough Ridge Park, transit is crucial for, crucial for my daily commuting needs. Particularly, the lack of fare integration between TTC and GO lines places a financial burden on students and commuters in general in Scarborough, prompting heavy reliance on the bus system. Uh, despite this, though, the city appears to be backtracking on budget commitments to a major project. Um, the draft budget has not yet allocated explicit funding for the Kennedy Station to STC busway, intended to replace Late Line 3. I'm asking that council plan for this project explicitly in the 2024, 2024 budget. As the originally intended uh, open date, opening date was supposed to be by end of 2025, with an estimated capital cost of up to 375 million for the construction period of 2023 to five and to fund operational costs until 2030. Uh, since the decommissioning of line one, uh, sorry, line three, a uh, daily rider spends about an extra 20 minutes commuting between STC and Kennedy station. The busway intended to replace Line 3 service was meant to start running by 2025, uh, especially given the plan was originally decided in April 2022, and construction should have become, begun in November of last year. Those extra 20 minutes contribute to people shifting over to pi private vehicle use and, as a result, traffic congestion. In November 2023, Instagram page Scarborough Spots posted a map depicting a 29% rise in Uber trips to Kennedy Station based on polling. Uh, I've received Instagram advertisements in my feed from Uber with an outright tone of gloating and claiming that they're providing a safe and convenient way to connect to the subway in response to this gap in formerly public services. Uh, ads in which they have literally stolen the aforementioned map for the ad zone purposes. Demographics, as uh, demographics such as students or working class people cannot afford to Uber or take a cab long term. And obviously, many are not yet in this position to purchase a vehicle. I have friends who, have needed to commute, uh, who need to commute close to or over two hours by TTC or GO bus from across the city or from Durham region just to reach the UTSC campus because they still need to live with family because even in this area, far from the downtown core, rent can be ridiculous. Councillors, I understand that there are practical, political, and cost considerations to continuing to fund these programs, but the benefits provided by these public services evidently return on the investment made. As for residents who are listening, uh, I encourage you to engage as much as possible with these budget consultation meetings, as well as other advocacy or advocacy group, uh, activist groups for municipal and provincial issues that matter to you, be it transit, healthcare, your kids' access to good education, your access to housing, your rights as tenants, and your rights as workers. I know everyone is struggling right now, or rather many people might be struggling right now, but if no one speaks up or does anything, nothing's going to be addressed. As of late, there's been an air of desperation hanging over the city. You can sense it everywhere a long time business closing down because of sheer cost of operation and COVID business loans, friends and family being so burnt out that they can't be there for you emotionally as much as you can for them, a sleeping homeless man being evicted by police from the subway on a cold negative 10 degree night. These are signs not just of the general economic state of the globe right now, but the public infrastructure in Toronto, such as transit, has not responded to the needs of the Toronto residents who need it most. I'd like to end my deputation with a quote from the late Jack Layton from the 2010 federal budget day. 
It's a budget that actually leaves the unemployed and seniors and other victims of this recession behind. Thank you so much. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is Paul Beatty, followed by Chris Langenfeld, followed by Cheryl Lewis Therab. Paul, thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Please double check the mic is turned on. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I don't have a big list of facts and figures, just some things that uh, I don't quite understand. You start off with this um, thing about indigenous lands and stuff like that. And tobogganing, or toboggan, is actually Algonquin for sled or sleigh, yet they banned tobogganing in so many parks and that, which is a Canadian tradition. And the other thing is the uh, city has a bylaw against feeding the birds, but it's okay to put out rat poison as much as you want, but you can't feed the birds. But an associate, she's Ojibwe, and said, no, you can feed the animals. You take care of the animals on the indigenous lands. But the rat poison, no. Yet there's no control over rat poison in this city. And it goes on. And yeah, so your cat or your dog eats the, the rat or it dissolves into the uh, water chain that we have. So those are kind of a couple of things that really kind of tick me. The other thing is this Sanfora Square name, okay? Uh, if you look at the word, the Sanfora, yes, it's a very beautiful picture. Uh, but in actual fact, the Sanfora tribe or clan in Africa was involved in the slave trade in the, back 18, the, the late 1800s and early 1900s. So why would you name a place that when we're already supposedly up in air about Dundas? So that, that kind of uh, really grates me. And this... This other thing um, about the property tax increase, you know, we're not getting 10 or 16 percent income on our CPP or old age security or pensions. So I don't know how, and you did mention something, and then maybe you did get the letter I sent you about increasing the, the uh, what is it, the, the amount that a single home, senior, single home income, and under this this limit, you're allowed uh, to defer your taxes or utility bills. I mean, I've sent that to Mr. Crawford. He took it up to 2021. I gave your office a couple of them, Councillor McKelvey, and I would like to see the results from that. So anyways, people, that's about it. I uh, kind of got off my shoulders and don't feel too bad about it. So any questions? Thank you. Any questions for the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us okay. today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Legenfeld, followed by Cheryl Lewis Therab, followed by Khadija Robel. You have five minutes, and please make sure your microphone's on. Be before I start, though, uh, they were going to, uh, I spoke to somebody here about making sure that this uh, overhead works and show me how to use it. So, <laughs> there, it's, it's oh, okay. Thank you. They've got it up there. So, is that uh, excellent? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak to you today, uh, both for myself and all the people here. Um, the last speaker here mentioned uh, the renaming of Dundas Square. Um, and uh, as we know, the city's proposing a 16.5% increase, uh, which includes, according to Councillor Moise's uh, website, a $2.7 million cost, of which $700,000 is going to be paid by Toronto taxpayers, and the rest is going to be paid uh, through other taxes other than Toronto property taxes in order to rename this. But in fact, what we know is looking at uh, other sources, apparently Henry Dundas's only uh, contribution to the slave trade was to uh, modify the act to include the word gradual to eliminate slavery, which made a, uh, the act pass, which the year before it had been uh, soundly defeated. Uh, in fact, three weeks ago, uh, the Toronto Sun um, reported that uh, apparently staff uh, intentionally withheld information from Toronto City Council that the information that they had provided was false about Mr. Dundas and that there was in fact other historical information. 
um, were told that there were 14,000 signatures on a petition that uh, called for the renaming of that square. In fact, there's currently over 24,000 signatures calling for the city to not spend this money on renaming it, but apparently we're still going ahead with it. Um, more importantly is the issue here of Toronto Police, which is the second largest line item in the city uh, behind transit. Um, currently, we're looking at a $1.17 billion uh, Toronto Police budget for next year. And one of the uh, reasons that Toronto Police use is that they claim it's the uh, cop to pop uh, ratio, the number of police officers to population. And they compare us to a number of other cities, but in fact, they include or they compare Toronto to cities that don't use special constables. And of course, we all know in Toronto we have uh, TTC, TCHC, U of T, court, traffic, and other police special constables. Uh, in fact, you look at Chicago has three times the number of uniformed officers of Toronto, and yet they have a high rate of uh, um, crime, whereas in Toronto we have uh, moderate crime in some areas and low crime in uh, other areas, and yet uh, the Toronto police provide you with false information. When you look back, in fact, at the 2021 uh, Toronto Police Services budget, they were reporting on number of hours spent on calls for service, and that went up from 2016-17 uh, at 2.4 hours per call to 2.45 hours to 2.5 hours to 2.9 hours by 2020. Um, and uh, then as of the 2021 budget, that was the last time Toronto Police reported that inf information to the public and to the uh, Toronto Police Services Board. So in fact, if we dealt with these issues of the fact that police are hanging around uh, at calls, and of course, one of the big issues we have now is the uh, Chief's declaration of uh, that protesting is not allowed on the Avenue Road Bridge. And so in fact, what we see is that we've got on January 13th, the day after the chief's declaration that uh, it was illegal to protest in parts of this city, uh, we end up with five officers, six more officers, and eight more officers after that. So 19 officers to arrest three people for exercising their rights and obeying the law. So instead we have police attacking those individuals and the Supreme Court of Canada has already dealt with this matter in Fleming versus Ontario where OPP arrested an individual who also wasn't breaking the law and was only exercising his rights to protest in that case against uh, indigenous land in Caledonia. Uh, there it ended up costing taxpayers through the OPP $338,000 for the one individual who was falsely arrested and assaulted by police officers. Uh, we're already seeing in one day we've had three people ar uh, arrested on trumped up charges and um, so presumably we're already on our way to a million dollars in expenses for that. What did the Supreme Court have to say about the rights of people? <sighs> Quoting Fleming versus Ontario 2019, as these authorities make clear, an act can be considered a breach of peace only if it involves some level of violence and a risk of harm. The chief doesn't claim there's been any of that in this city uh, as a result of these Avenue Road protests. Where police action prevents individuals from lawfully expressing themselves because their expression might provoke or enrage others, freedom of expression as guaranteed by Section 2B of the Charter is also implicated. Again, final thoughts. This matter is, uh, is already been declared a violation having police declare and the chief of police declare that things that protesting is illegal in certain parts of the uh, city isn't something that he has authority to do it violates a slew of the charter rights that uh, allow for protesting freedom of assembly peaceful assembly association freedom Thank of opinion you. and expression liberty security of the per person uh, secure against unreasonable Thank you. search You're and now seizure 30 seconds over time i just need you to wrap up um, and unfortunately the uh, police board and the uh, the city is spending money to uh, increase the budget for police rather than dealing with the issues that we need dealt with. Thank you. Uh, questions of the deputant? Seeing none, our next deputant is Cheryl Lewis Therab, who is on video, followed by Khadija Rabel, followed by Michael Longfeld. I'll provide a hard copy here if you'd like it. Great. Um, do we have Cheryl online? 
Yes, I'm here. Thanks, Cheryl. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Hi again, my name is Cheryl Lewis the Rab, and I am a resident of Scarborough Rouge Park. Homeowners are currently being squeezed out of their homes due to the high mortgage rate, high food prices, and now the proposed 10.5 to 16% tax increase being imposed by the city. As an immigrant to Canada, having worked in nonprofit for over 20 years, including the shelter system, I understand the plight of the homeless as well as the importance of providing homes for newcomers and refugees. I totally agree that we need to effectively fund our shelters as well as provide affordable homes. However, this burden should not be placed largely on the shoulders of homeowners who are already stretched to the limit. As a shelter supervisor, I had the opportunity to speak with many residents who were formerly homeowners. If we continue down this path, many others will become a part of this statistic. The city has cautioned that if the federal government does not come forward with 250 million in funding for refugee claimants in the Toronto shelter system, the city will have no choice but to impose a 6% federal impacts levy, raising the total residential tax increase to 16.5%. Toronto is a world-class city, but living in this city has become a nightmare. Imposing a 6.5% tax hike is unreasonable. The proposed 2024 budget includes 620 million in cuts. While the city is seeking to cut costs by ending essential services, such as the windrow plowing services in an effort to save 4 million this year and 16 million annually thereafter, the city is looking to add non-essential services, such as extended library hours, including Sunday services. Cutting the windrow service to 262,000 homes would result in greater hardship for seniors and people with disabilities. Taking away the Windrow services would also potentially take away from the Windrow employees' earning potential. With regards to library services, I love a good book. However, libraries are currently open six days a week and offer myriad services. If we are targeting low-income individuals, including newcomers and the homeless, could they not access these services during those six days? There are several other ways by which residents can access library services 24-7, including borrowing books online. I'm sure that somewhere within those parameters, everyone can gain access without extending to Sunday service, thereby saving this expense. Scarborough has an aging population, many of whom are experiencing varying health concerns making it more and more difficult to clear their own driveway and even more so to lift the heavy snow after it has been dumped by the snow plows. Cutting the windrow service will greatly affect our community. I have personally experienced the effect of huge lumps of snow being dumped at the bottom of my driveway right after my family has spent over an hour clearing it in below freezing temperature. Rather than decrease this service, we need it to be improved. This is a necessity. Budget Chief Shelley Carroll indicated that she asked city staff to ensure that this cut was front and center so it would be debated when the budget launched. I would like to thank our Councillor Deputy Mayor Jennifer McKelvey as well as Councillor Holiday for bringing this um, to the fore and for highlighting the plight of the residents. I know it's a difficult situation. However, I would like to implore the mayor and city staff to continue to seek other tax saving measures while keeping the issue of the Windrow service, the plight of seniors, the refugees and homeless individuals, as well as the residents of Toronto, especially the residents of Toronto. Final thought. Front. 
home owners should not be held liable for the shortfall due to the province or the federal government not stepping up to the plate. The residents of Toronto simply cannot afford this exorbitant property tax hike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us today. Our next speaker is Khadija Rabel, followed by Michael Longfield, followed by Nancy Prendig Prendergast. Do you have Khadija? Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Please ensure uh, the microphone is turned on. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, before I start, um, I would like to share my time speaking with Amrith David as we both work uh, for the same organization representing students' concerns and needs. That's good. Okay. So, hello, my name is Khadija Roble. I am a student at the University of Toronto Scarborough and an active community member of the Scarborough Guildwood area. Alongside my colleague Amrith, we represent over 17,000 students from the University of Toronto Scarborough through our roles as Vice President External and President at the Scarborough Campus Students' Union. And today we are here to speak on their behalf and shed light on their concerns and demands. The U of T Scarborough campus is one that is primarily filled with student commuters. In fact, of all post-secondary institutions in Ontario, U of T Scarborough holds the highest number of OSAP users. Our students come from many different regions of the city, whether it be the downtown core, Etobicoke, Mississauga, or the various neighborhoods that make up Scarborough. Many of those students that utilize the Scarborough LRT to get to our campus are now left with using shuttle buses until further notice. This is what we are here to speak about today. On behalf of our thousands of students who must face long hours of commute every day in this rigid Canadian weather to try to get to their lectures and exams on time, we urge you to fund and build the Scarborough Busway. Scarborough needs to be prioritized. Scarborough is an important part of the city with loads of amazing residents, businesses, and community hubs such as our campus. However, more often than not, Scarborough is placed the last in the list of priorities, especially in regards to transit. It is now time that we recognize and provide adequate service to a region of the city that most requires it. Years back, UTSC has made an agreement with the city that students support the funding of the Toronto Pan Am Sports Centre through tuition in exchange for the city completing the Eglinton East LRT by 2015. Fast forward to today, not only has the city not upheld their promise to students, but service has regressed. We were promised a busway by 2025 to replace the loss of the LRT. Now we are told that construction will begin in 2025 yet the busway plan has been adopted since April 2022. This leaves commuters and our students another three to four years of shuttle bus usage, another 20 to 40 minutes of their time spent in crowded buses instead of studying for their exams or spending time with their loved ones. We need adequate alternative to get to Kennedy before the opening of the subway extension. That alternative should be one that provides service comparable to the LRT. And the busway is the only project that can meet those expectations. Having a busway means having a route straight to Kennedy without traffic getting in the way and adding to commuters' time in public transit. This also means that buses who utilize the same route as the shuttle buses will deal with less congestion, therefore reducing commuting time for all transit users. If funding to build a Scarborough busway is not allocated in the 2024 budget, we could lose another year with no construction. So our demand is simple. Honor the set deadlines you have provided to the public. That means prioritizing the Scarborough Busway into the city's 2024 budget and having its construction plan start before 2025. Every day that the busway is not built, transit users lose at least 20 minutes each day stuck in traffic. We, the students, and all other commuters cannot afford to waste more time while government officials argue about who should pay for the busway. Thank you. That's it. Okay, I thought you were sharing the time. Yeah, that's okay. It. Um, uh, great, thank you. Are there any questions of the deputants? Uh, go ahead. Thank you, uh, through your chair. Do you know um, how many students at UTSC are using the bus, the bus route now that was the SRT? 
Uh, we don't have exact numbers, but we know that it's within the thousands. We have a big uh, commuter uh, community. Yeah. And is your student association reaching out to the provincial MPPs in Scarborough at all? We have previously, yes. So for years, we've been uh, in conversation with MPPs as well. In terms of transit, um, we recognize that the transit issues in, at UTSC specifically are very expensive. Um, so, for example, the UFT Mississauga campus, because of the one uh, option of um, transit, they have free passes. Um, which is which comes through the student fees, but again, UTC students are left out of that, so that is also why we're here. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Additional questions, the deputants? Okay, seeing none, can we just ask the second presenter, if you can just register, they'll put your name on the record before you go, thank you. Thank okay, you. Uh, the next speaker is Michael Longfield, followed by Nancy Prendergast, followed by Phil Potton. Do you have Michael? In the room, thank you, Michael. When, when you're settled in, just make sure the microphone's on. You have five minutes. Uh, it seems like it's on. <clears throat> um, hello, Deputy Mayor McKelvey, uh, Deputy Mayor Morley, uh, Councillor Chang, and uh, thanks for joining us here today, Councillors Thompson, Councillor Myers, Councillor Lainsley, and I believe Councillor Mantis is with us online as well. My name is Michael Longfield, and I'm the Executive Director of Cycle Toronto, a member-supported charity working with you to make Toronto a better cycling city for everyone. As a side note, I do want to give a shout out to our transit system that got me here today relatively quickly from out in Ward 9, but I did sort of highlight as well the loss of the Scarborough RT and the urgent need for a replacement dedicated busway. A great cycling city also needs a great transit system. In a growing city like Toronto that is making real efforts to confront our housing crisis, expanding our transportation network and providing people with more transportation options is essential to keep Toronto moving. Toronto's Transform TO climate action goals of making three quarters of local neighborhood trips walkable and bikeable by 2030 will only happen with a strong investment in our cycling network citywide and in Scarborough. And that investment needs to start today. I'm here today to urge you to tell your council, uh, council colleagues and Mayor Chow to ensure the 2024 budget sufficiently funds the final year of the council approved 2022-2024 cycling network plan, including money to fund tra transformational projects like the Eglinton Today Complete Streets and Danforth Kingston Complete Streets here in Scarborough. Bike lanes are a great investment. Dollar for dollar bikeways are one of the best investments a city can make for transportation, for the environment and for public health. Yes, not every person can or will choose to ride a bike, and not every, bi not every trip is bikeable. But a recent study highlighted in Forbes magazine concludes that bike lanes pay for themselves in less than a year, thanks to the offset in greenhouse gas emissions and the benefit to public health by promoting more, active, more exercise and more active communities. And this doesn't include the unmeasurable costs for road safety benefits and lives saved. Looking at the 10-year trans tr capital budget trans uh, transportation plan, I am optimistic about what the city can do and what it can accomplish with the potential savings from the New Deal and reallocating almost $2 billion for the Gardner and DVP state of good repairs. I do want to highlight, though, that the potential risk of the New Deal of Toronto losing authority to the Ministry of Transportation over the use and design of our roadways within 400 metres of provincial highway on, ramp, on and off ramps. Anyone who has walked or biked uh, near an on or off ramp near the 401 or the 4 427 is viscerally aware of how terrifying it can be. If the same happens to the DVP and to the Gardner and jurisdiction folds over to MTO, this could have catastrophic road safety and uh, accessibility consequences for our city. The bikeways we need to build and fund in this budget across Toronto and in Scarborough aren't just for the people that are using them today. It's for the residents, families and children that will be using them tomorrow when they're on the ground. After the loss of bikeways on Pharmacy, Birchmont, and Brimley, it's time Scarborough receives its fair share of the investment in their active transportation network, which includes implementing the Danforth Kingston Complete Streets this year. Funding to ensure the wildly successful bike share program as well, so it can expand across all 25 wards, will further unlock thousands of new bike trips across the city. Again, thank you so much for your time and for your support. I look forward to speaking with you about this time next year to fund a suitably ambitious 2025-2027 cycling network plan to build hopefully at least 100 kilom 150 kilometers rather, of new bikeways that further connect our growing city. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining Thanks. us. Our next deputant is Nancy Prendergast, followed by Phil Potton, followed by 
Labuba Gemma. Do we have Nancy online? Hi, Nancy, can you unmute and go ahead? Hi, Nancy. Am I unmuted now? Yes, we can hear you now. Hi. Thank you. Go ahead. You have five minutes. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak about this issue important to seniors, the disabled, and people who are not physically very strong. Like Ms. Lewis Thurlab before me, I'm asking you to keep windrow clearing in the city budget. When shoveling freshly fallen snow can be good exercise. The snow banks the city plow makes are something else again. The snow is packed down so hard, it becomes like ice and is very hard to shovel. On wide residential streets without sidewalks, as in the South Scarborough neighborhood where I live, the windrows can be very high. If one pays to have the driveway cleared, the workers usually come soon after the snowfall and their work is done long before the city plow gets to the residential streets. So then it's up to the resident to clear the icy windrows, leading to the risk of back injury or worse. Many can't afford, even if they could pay someone the first time, to pay someone to do this even harder job. If one can't clear the windrows, one can't get a car out and other transport, such as taxis or even emergency vehicles, can't get near the house. That's a serious safety issue. And even getting away from the house at all can be in question on streets like mine with no sidewalks because one can't even get to the road to walk on it without climbing over the big icy snowbank. That raises the chances of a fall for a senior or a person who needs a mobility device to get around, just can't get over it. I realize that some may say it's not fair that the windrows are cleared in some areas and not in others. It's my understanding that it's done in neighborhoods that don't have on-street parking and where the streets are wide. So the windrow plow can get right into the bottom of the driveway. But the conditions that make it possible to the, do the windrow clearing are the ones that make it necessary in the first place. The wide streets have more snow on them than the narrow ones, and they have cars in the driveways and the garages, thereby being trapped by the windrows, rather than being the cars being parked on the streets where the, the plows would have already cleared the way. As Mr. Harrison said earlier in this session, Services are not equally distributed in the city. And in my 30 some years in Scarborough, I've observed that Scarborough does tend to get the thin <laughs> edge of the stick. And as he mentioned on rinks and others have mentioned on transit. So please leave us with something we do have, especially since it's so important to the health and safety of many people. If the windrow clearing must be canceled, please consider adding it to the service that pays for sidewalk clearing for seniors and the disabled in areas that do have sidewalks. But I still think it's more efficient just to keep it for everyone where it's feasible and needed, as is the case now. I hope the money can be found in the, the budget to allow for areas that need windrow clearing to keep it. Toronto is a big diverse city and not every neighborhood has the same needs. Thank you again. Thank you, Nancy. Are there any questions of the deputant? Uh, seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is Pil, uh, sorry, Phil Potton, followed by Lubaba, Lubaba Gemma, followed by Derek Moran. Do we have Phil in the room? No, online? No, okay. Uh, Lubaba in the room? Thank you.
Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Please um, make sure the mic is on. Wonderful. Hello, council um, or committee. Um, my name is Lou Baba Gemma, and I'm a resident of Scarborough Southwest. I moved here with my family almost 13 years ago, and the priorities that I'm here to discuss with you are primarily related to items that fall under the state of good repair. To start, I'd like to express my support for the proposed property tax increase. Property inc tax increases are an essential tool for funding repairs and further capital investments in our city. The 10.5% or even 16.5% propo proposed increase keeps us at a meager property tax in comparison to many other large cities across the world. An area that is integral to reallocating further is the police budget. Anyone who was sentient in 2020 is no stranger to the violence that is police brutality. As elected officials, it is imperative that you enact policies that protect our residents, and my experience with the Toronto Police Services has only been concerning. The police have not helped, but rather made worse domestic violence situations in my home at numerous points in my adolescent and adult life. They have watched while I and my friends have experienced a hate crime just this past November and repeatedly dismissed or ignored by reports of Islamophobic crimes. There was a recent study published in the journal, uh, Canadian Public Policy, that showed that there was no correlation between police budget increases and lower crime rates. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have seen this study published in our uh, mainstream media. I urge you to continue investing in resources like the Community Crisis Response, as well as EPIC, the eviction prevention in the community, uh, that, homo that uh, homelessness precarity uh, program. Um, as these folks, these folks, these programs and staff have been tangibly helpful, both um, for me as an individual and for um, residents that I have supported through casework in different um, uh, work environments. To reiterate, I'd like to emphasize that the priority here should be care rather than criminalization. Now, when it comes to transit, I have lots to say, as most Scarborough residents do, but I will keep it brief. When I moved here 13 years ago, we had four subway lines. By now, I thought we'd have more, and instead we have three. What is particularly important here, and many of um, my fellow speakers have also reiterated this, but what is particularly important is that Scarborough needs to be a priority. Scarborough has been left behind time and time again. The busway is now two years behind schedule, which is absolutely unacceptable. Originally, the busway was supposed to be completed by 2025. Now the latest report is saying that construction will start in 20... Sorry be complete by 2025 and now the latest report is saying that construction will start in 2025. Construction should have started as soon as the Scarborough RT was uh, planned to go out of service in November 2023. I like these are very predictable things um, but the TTC even adopted this plan for a busway in April 2022 and so what I want to reiterate here is that Funding for the busway must be included in the 2024 city budget or Scarborough will be left behind once again. Transit riders report that their bus rider, that their bus trips can take up to 25 minutes or longer between Kennedy and Scarborough Town Center. This means that a busway would save them 10 minutes. Something that can be funded right now specifically is uh, funding for more staff to speed up the design work and funding for the expropriations needed so that there are no more delays. To pivot a little, we know that Toronto is a city where 50% of residents are renters and that number is predicted to grow. In 13 years, with three modest incomes, furious budgeting and cutting corners, my family still has not been able to put together a down payment for a house. My mother's apartment building is falling apart because the slumlord who owns it refuses to make real repairs like eradicating mold that is in almost every unit. Instead, the city is allowing superintendents and managers to swiftly paint over mold just for it to come back within days. This is not an uncommon practice at all. Rather, tenants are often living in fear of retaliation from their landlords, and many continue to suffer with these continuously dangerous conditions. While a handful of homeowners may complain about property taxes, my mother, who has a rent-controlled unit, will see an increase of $42 a month, more than subsidizing the property tax increase, and that is a single unit in her building. 
The difference between us as renters and our neighboring homeowners is that our landlord will pay property taxes that go towards repairing our city and benefiting all of us, and their property accrues equity over time as well. For us tenants, on the other hand, the thoughts. increased fees we pay go straight into our landlord's pocket. To end, I would like to remind Budget Committee that Toronto is a sanctuary city, and it's important to that if this is a title that we are claiming, that when we bring in countless migrants and refugees here, we cannot simply cast them onto the streets to suffer. Rather than punishing our new, newest Torontonians, it is imperative that we invest in infrastructure that keeps us safe, such as the recent uh, federal funding. Obviously, that's something um, that has been extremely positive. Um, and I also implore you to re revisit larger budget lines, such as the Toronto Police Services, to continue supporting rehabilitation practices Thank over you. the criminalization of poverty. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us, Lubaba. Thank you. Our next presenter is Derek Moran, followed by Aidan Lockhart, followed by uh, Yobi Saravana Bavin. Thank you, Derek. You have five minutes. Please ensure the microphone's on. I just want to, uh, for the record, show that um, someone from the City of Toronto told me that they just they had called security on the TTC riders people on the basis that the city of Toronto does not allow signs at these meetings. I can tell you all, I, I explained when, chief so when Mark Saunders was the chief of police, I was at the police board and read the Supreme Court case law that says you can, that's part of freedom of expression, holding signs at these meetings. Not only that, you can watch the recording and see Mark Saunders saying to his uh, officer providing security, shaking his head, waving them off, like to leave them alone. So like no clapping, that's a form of expression, no signs. I mean, how do you people constantly get these simple fundamental rights and freedoms of ours so wrong? It's just every time almost I come to one of these meetings, something like this happens. So for people that don't know, uh, Councillor Cheng here and Deputy Mayor Morley are on the police board. They also know that uh, Councillor Burnside, who's also on the police board last month, gave a very great example of one of the shell games, as he puts it, that the city of Toronto plays with the public's money. The biggest shell game that the city of Toronto is playing with the public's money is this fictional $1.8 billion deficit. So in the Dictionary of Canadian Law, a deficit is defined as an amount by which expenditures exceed revenue. And as these two council members know, there is no deficit. What's going on is the city of Toronto is taking money from the budget, sticking it in another pocket, essentially, which is your reserve funds, and then saying, oh my God, we spent that money and we ran out and we still need more. So now we have a deficit. That is not a deficit. That is another shell game, as Councillor Burnside explained at the police board last month. So um, is this... Uh, Overhead projector work. I was just told to put uh, something. Is this? Does this? I was just told to. I'll just ask them to display it. I think it's at the top. Budget yeah. There you go. Budget cuts. Thank you. So this is your life, Deputy Mayor McKelvey, at the city uh, executive committee council meeting. After you know, after you heard uh, Damien Mule's presentation on how the city is over budgeting, you asked the CFO, Stephen Conforti. Are we over budgeting? I'll never forget the look on your face when you were stunned to first find out about this. This guy does not answer your question. He gives you, dude starts talking about when debt is issued. You did not ask him, when do we start issuing debt? You asked him, are we over budgeting? And I guess in his eyes, you're just one of the deputy mayors because he did not answer your question. So following that, here we go with Councillor Cheng here at City Council followed up on that. She must have heard Damien Mule's presentation. So I was reading this and seeing that we have estimated to end the year under spending almost $1.6 billion this year in capital. Is that correct? And same buddy guy here, CFO Stephen Conforti says, uh, through you, Madam Speaker, it's correct. Now, I didn't bring a calculator with me. But let's, let's work the, all this out all together. $1.8 billion minus $1.6 billion, oh my God, that would mean that we would only have $200 million deficit. So I have an objection to make to this budget. 
as it is not in the public's interest to raise property taxes this high, as the three of you all know by now that the corporation of the city of Toronto does not have a deficit and for years has been operating under false pretenses with the public and taking huge chunks of revenue from the budget that went unspent and instead redirecting it to your reserve funds and then lying to the public that there's still a $1.8 billion deficit. Now, this was again back from Damien Mool with his presentation back in October. I have another, <clears throat> another slide, uh, another thing for the overhead. I've wasted a lot of time here waiting. Oh, come on. All right, here we go. So another slide Damien Mool had here was in 2002, transfer to reserves from operating budget, $1.3 billion, okay? Capital budget underspend, $2 billion. So let's add that up. That's $3.3 billion minus $1.8 billion. That means you could have paid off this deficit back in 2022 alone and still had $1.5 billion left over as a surplus. But as Deputy Premier Ford and Councillor, no, uh, the finance manager, Christian Freeland, keeps on saying, you guys are redirecting money and putting it into your reserve funds instead of paying off the deficit. And it's quite frankly a lie that the people of Toronto are being told. So we'll see who votes for this. Final thoughts. Uh, back in coming February. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Oh. Councillor Chang has a question. Thank you. Thank you for the very uh, interesting meme you've created. I've never seen that before. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, did you know that operating and capital budgets come from different revenue sources and are actually calculated differently? And also that capital funding uh, that's uh, allocated to a project carries over. So uh, we, we can't unfund projects that are en route to being in completion and therefore it'd be very difficult to just take that money and reallocate it, it would mean that things that are in the pipeline would come to a halt. Just wanted to clarify and see if you knew that. So you're asking me, do I know? Yeah, did you know that, that there's a separation between capital and operating and therefore it's very difficult. In principle, it's a, it's a wonderful idea. Personally, you know, if it was my bank account, I could easily move. You know, I won't renovate my, you know, I don't know, I don't have a deck, but I won't renovate my deck and I'll pay for my children's braces. That makes a lot of sense on a personal budget level, but on a city level of that, of the scope of ours, when money is allocated to a project, we need to keep that money allocated to that project because it's, it, that project has to be brought to completion. So this is just to clarify to see if you knew this. First of all, it sounds like I'm listening to Dr. Davila answer a question. What, like you just said a whole bunch of wordy stuff. Okay. I'm not here to be cross-examined. Okay. Your, your reserves in 2012 were 2.9 billion. Now, it, uh, Henrik Beckman is saying your reserves as of September 30th, 2023 are up to 12.9 billion. You've increased them by 10 billion. I mean, w when does this stop? S you, you get a budget, you get the revenue in the budget, spend, you can't, uh, you, so you, you know, wait a second, you know I went through this in front of you with police board member, Nick uh, Migliore, and he told me I'm right. A deficit, you have to go through and spend 100% of the budget, of the revenue you had in the budget before you can say you have a deficit. You guys are redirecting money into your reserves. These people don't know that. That's the shell, a big shell game Councillor Burnside was talking about. You, you people need to be, start being honest with the, the we public. We can find another opportunity to speak about it, but thank you for making a deputation. Should, should we make an appointment right now? Thank Thank you for joining us. What, no, but just, what, when questions? are we going to make the offer? I, I love the opportunity to speak to Councillor Chang Moore. When, when are we going to do it, though? Because I, I can't, I can't uh, get my own councillor, Mike Cole, to even answer my emails. I can speak with you briefly at the end of this meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. At 4.30. Thank you, Councillor Chang. <laughs> I could send her an email. Will, will she actually answer it other than the councillor from my area, Mike Cole? Okay, thank you. I don't believe Councillor Ainsley asked for the floor, so. Um, but thanks for chirping in there. Okay, uh, thank you for your deputation. Were there any additional questions of the deputant?
Okay. Um, our next speaker is Aidan Lockhart, followed by Yobi Sarah Vanna Bavin, followed by Gulid Ariel. Do we have Aidan online? Okay, Aidan, thank you for joining us. If you go ahead, you have five minutes. Thanks so much, folks. Uh, apologies if I cut out. I've had some connectivity issues. Uh, in any case, my name is Aidan Lockhart. I'm a PhD candidate, police researcher, and sessional lecturer in the Department of Sociology at the University of Guelph. And I'm a resident of Blurus Village. And I'm here today in solidarity with folks who deserve $1.2 billion, far more than the Toronto Police Service. If police are a service, as we say they are, then they disproportionately serve neighborhoods that are profoundly underserved by the market economy. Far more than victims of crime, police serve racialized and indigenous people, migrants, people in mental health distress and addiction crisis, and unhoused people. And while these tend to intersect, the one demographic benefiting from police services more than any other is poor people. The vast majority of police resources, and I hear this from police themselves in my own research, go towards managing the precariousness and insecurity that's created by a class structure that consolidates resources and power at the very top at the expense of those at the very bottom. And decades of research supports this. Peer-reviewed article after peer-reviewed article, including the most recent reported by, on by the Toronto Star, demonstrates that police budgets have no consistent correlation to the actual crime rates. And that is a scary realization, right? What do we do if our primary crime response strategy has no impact on the actual crime rate? Well, one thing we shouldn't do is panic and double down on a losing proposition because we actually have available, effective, and proven alternatives. Housing, mental health support, community programs, addiction support, actual poverty elimination strategies that don't rely on paternalistic programs pe preaching parsimony. We're not poor because we're dumb. We're poor because the structures of poverty are exponential. Poverty is expensive. You buy smaller bags of rice more often because you can't afford the big ones. You pay tickets for burnt out headlights instead of buying new ones. You rent, paying for someone else's mortgage instead of building up equity in your own home only to be renovated by Dutch developers. Virtually no one thinks warehousing poor people in prison is acceptable. But, they'll say, we can't just give people food, even if they're starving, or give people housing, even if they're freezing. Even if it does make our community safer, more vibrant, and the lives of our neighbors more dignified, we can't just give people free things. They need to work for it. You put in work, labor, effort. When you sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears, you deserve your fortune. But if wealth is deserved, then Galen Weston's deservingness didn't begin with his uniquely prodigious work ethic. It began in the late 1800s when his grandfather started a bakery, great-grandfather, excuse me. His wealth is not commensurate with his effort or his deservingness. It's commensurate with his luck, the luck of being born a Weston. That luck means he can be convicted of a massive price-fixing scheme, pay literally inconsequential fines, and continue to make record profits. And while average people struggle to pay for food in his stores, he pays to expand his already expansive surveillance and security apparatus to make sure they have no choice. And of course, people will say, sure, even if we grant that social support rather than police force makes people safer, how do we pay for it? Well, if a wealth tax feels unfair, I propose a luck tax. And if that doesn't cover it, I have another 1.2 billion ideas. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is, sorry, let me just, okay, good, just wanna make sure I'm in the right place. Uh, you'll be Sarah Vanna Bavin, followed by Guled Aral, followed by Sheila Paisi Allen. Thank you for joining us, Yobi. You have five minutes, just make sure the microphone's on. Uh. 
So, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board committee. Uh, my name is Yobi Saravanababan. I am a resident of Toronto, where I live in Ward 21. I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Today, I am here to speak about the various issues that the city of Toronto is facing. Due to the scheduled time at the budget committee, I will focus on five of the main issues, which are inflation, the cost of living, the housing crisis, transportation, and the lack of shelter spaces. I ask the Toronto City Council to focus on funding important city services, such as better public transit, affordable housing, more shelter spaces, and an increase in jobs. The, two, the issue matters to me because I've learned that the city of Toronto faced various issues that are, affected, that are affecting the people in Toronto as a result of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy and the policies by the previous municipal government, which include lower property taxes, higher transit bills, and less funding towards city services. There are issues in transportation which are crowding, delays, and disruptions in buses, subways, and streetcars, and people, including me, must wait for another bus, subway, or streetcar which can affect their plans and schedule, such as work and school. Some examples of how this will impact my community are the closure of the Scarborough OT and the lack of shelter spaces for refugees, asylum seekers, and unhoused people. The closure of the Scarborough OT has negatively affected the ability of people to take transportation into Scarborough, even though the Scarborough subway extension is currently being constructed and there are calls to build a busway in Scarborough. They are concerned about the lack of shelter, shelter spaces for refugees, asylum seekers, and unhoused people. Refugees and asylum seekers came to Canada because of issues in their countries while unhoused people face issues which include inflation, the cost of living, and the housing crisis. And this led more people to live in the streets. When I took the TTC and went for a walk in the streets of downtown Toronto, I saw many unhealthy people living in the TTC and the streets of downtown Toronto. In conclusion, I recommend that the Toronto City Council should act the federal government to increase funding towards shelter spaces for refugees, asylum seekers, and unhealthy people, and they should also act for more funding from the federal government and the provincial government to address the climate crisis or climate change. The Toronto City Council should also consider that there is a need for a new subway train in line two, the need for additional new subway train for line one and line two that can help solve overcrowding, the need for a busway in Scarborough that is yet to be funded, and the need for more red bus-only lanes for shuttle bus that can help reduce traffic. Finally, there should be an increase in property taxes and an increase in funding for city services. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Guled Aral, followed by Sheila Paisi Allen, followed by Doug Pritchard. Hello, everyone. Thank you. You have five minutes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Guled Aral. I'm the program coordinator for the Scarborough Civic Action Network, or you can refer to it as GAN. Scarborough Civic Action Network is a nonpartisan network that aims to support building empowered communities in Scarborough through civic engagement activities that address inequalities. Um, we also do this by helping um, to convene, connect, and enable the civic actions of people who are working to address uh, inequalities and improve the quality of life in Scarborough. One of the biggest things we hear almost every single day, which you've heard a lot of today, is transportation and the difficulties residents here in Scarborough have with it. Um, this summer, Scarborough saw firsthand what the underinvestment in transit leads to with the derailment of the Scarborough RT. 
which was pushed way past its lifetime um, because we kept on delaying the, on investing in the transit that Scarborough needed so badly. Um, when we talk, we were talking about a Scarborough subway for over a decade, and we probably won't be getting it for almost as long. And as we kept on delaying, delaying, and delaying, Scarborough residents today are literally being left in the cold, waiting on buses when they should have been on rapid transit already today. Which brings me why I'm here, which you've heard a lot of people talk about. Um, Scarborough is speaking with such a loud voice saying that um, we don't want any more delays and that we, we want to busway construction started ASIP and must be funded in the 2024 city budget. Time is running out. Um, if funding to speed up the building of a Scarborough busway is not allocated in this budget, we could use it another year. Um, like you've already heard, it was supposed to be done in 2025 and now it looks like it's not going to even be started until then. Um, every single day that we delay, we're costing Scarborough Transit riders collectively almost 4,000 hours every single day. The TTC adopted its busway plan in 2022 and, is, and we're still continuing to um, push, the, um, push it down the road. Should have started the day the RT, this construction should have started the day the RT closed. Um, as we all know, in the recent mayoral by-election, Olivia Chow promised Scarborough that she would go ahead with the project with or without funding from the province. Um, she planned to use the money saved by rebuilding the eastern portion of the Gardner Expressway to pay for the project. But now that the province is fully uploading to Gardner, there's no reason why this busway should not be included um, in the city capital project um, um, budget to further, and further fund it to get it finished as soon as possible. Scarborough Transit riders cannot afford to waste away another year. Let's put, this, uh, let's put the budget, um, the funding in the budget um, to, um, um, and, and whatever funding needed to speed up this project, and let's get Scarborough moving again. Thank you so much for your time, and that's all. Thank you. Are there questions to Jeppe Chen? Okay, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the deputies for all staying on time. Very impressive. Um, the next speaker is Sheila Paisi Allen, followed by Doug Pritchard, followed by Valerie Endicott. Thank you for joining us, Sheila. You have five minutes. Hello. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Sheila Paisi Allen, and I'm speaking on behalf of TTC Riders, a membership based transit organization. And I'm here to speak about a couple of transit pieces in the budget that need more funding support, the Scarborough Busway service and the low income fare pass. But I first just wanted to acknowledge and speak in support of raising property taxes to balance the budget and pay for important city services because past city councils have shielded homeowners from property tax increase. Transit riders have been squeezed through fares rising faster than the rate of inflation and services being cut. Um, and so in addition to supporting property tax, TTC Riders is asking federal MPs to chip in for Toronto services and also um, City Council to look at other revenue tools like a commercial, proper, or a commercial parking levy on big malls and commercial landlords later this year. So for, you've heard from many speakers today about the Scarborough busway, so I'll be really brief. But, you know, just to remind you that the TTC board approved the busway plan in April 2022. And construction was meant to begin as soon as the RT was scheduled to go out of service in November of last year. Um, the reason that construction hasn't started is that funding was never secured to move forward with design. And what um, the TTC did is pay up front for design and ask the province for reimbursement. So we don't see why we can't do that again, invest the necessary money now so that we don't lose any more precious time without that replacement busway because we've heard about how much time people are, are losing every single day. The second issue I want to speak about is about transit service. And although we're thrilled that service is starting to be brought back from what was cut in, in previous year's budgets, it's not as rosy as it sounds and it's causing some accessibility concerns. And so thank you to Councillor Lily Cheng for asking staff last week about how this is playing out. The TTC staff confirmed that 1% of the service being in increased in this budget is actually getting eaten up in congestion on our streets. Um, and that service is still being planned for standing room only during the off-peak period. And that is a big problem for seniors, people with mobility devices who are being asked, um, wheel trans users are being asked to take conventional TTC during off-peak hours. So it's really important that there's enough service running in the off-peak. Um, and that's why, you know, raising property taxes and investing even more in the TTC is so important. Uh, and then the last issue I wanted to speak about is protecting uh, the low-income transit discount known as the fare pass. 
this budget freezes fares and it, you know, it recognizes the affordability um, crisis in our city, but it doesn't reduce fares for anyone. And we're worried about some fare pass users um, being at risk of actually losing the current discount that they have. I'll get into the, the details of why. Um, so the fare pass, for those who don't know, is a transit discount of $2.10 single fares and monthly passes of $123.25. Honestly, it's not affordable for anyone um, receiving social assistance, but, but that's the discount that exists right now. It was approved in, by council in 2016. And right now, people receiving OW, ODSP, um, child care fee subsidy and housing supports re can receive it if they meet the income threshold. And for a single person, it's about $31,500 a year. That's the low income measure plus 15%. The last phase is supposed to cover all low income people under that income threshold in Toronto. It still hasn't been fully funded after years, but last year, a small bit of, of money was allocated to tr start expanding it. Well, because it wasn't enough money to expand it to everyone, the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office has said we're going to lower the income threshold for everyone. Um, and because during the pandemic, reapplications were paused, that hasn't affected anyone yet. But if those um, reapplications resume, some people that are today, let's say you're earning $25,000 a year, you could try to reapply and lose your fare pass discount because the new income threshold is just around $20,500 for a single person. Um, so that's a huge income difference. That's $11,000. Uh, and so we just urge you that to make sure that the fare pass access is protected and kept at that original cutoff level. And of course, continue to deepen the, the discount, especially for people receiving social assistance. Um, and then lastly, of course, we want to see more funding to expand bus and streetcar lanes um, and for council to take a care-based approach to safety um, by continuing to hire supportive frontline staff rather than police to create a supportive and welcoming TTC. So all of these investments that we'd like to see, it speaks to the importance of increasing the property tax like you proposed um, and of course other revenue tools. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, Councillor Chang. Thank you, Sheila, for making a deputation. I'm just wondering, I, I agree that um, people, especially who are an OW, ODSP, it's incredibly low to survive. It's actually criminal how low these rates are. But I wonder, is there, I know in certain circumstances, there are opportunities for people to ask for some money for transportation through their OW and ODSP worker. And I, it's unfortunately, it's usually tied with medical appointments or other things. But um, while the city tries to do our part, which, you know, we are stretching to do that, and we'll take this into consideration what you've shared, is there an opportunity to also advocate that perhaps there should be just a permanent transportation subsidy for those who need it, who are on ODSP and OW. So rather than having to consistently prove you have medical appointments, that perhaps, you know, since it's so low, that they should get that subsidy regardless of, you know, why they need that transportation. Yeah, I, I haven't... Um thought through that um, specific idea, but certainly the you know Poverty Reduction Strategy Office staff, or sorry, SDFA staff have said that they're looking at actually deepening the fair pass discount for people receiving OW and ODSP, and we would really like to see that because transit has to be free for people receiving social, it has to be free for, you know, we like to see it be free for everyone, but especially people that, you know, it, it's, it's, $123.25 is just completely unaffordable mm -hmm. um, for someone earning just more than $700 a month. So, um, you know, the City of Toronto administers OW and ODSP. They know who everyone is, and there is no reason that people need to keep, you know, reapplying instead of just um, having universal access to something that's so important for their health um, and access to other services. So I guess it's a it would be a flow through funding that we would need to ask for from province to be able to stably provide that to all OW. So perhaps that's something we could discover together if there's an opportunity to ask for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Additional questions, the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Sheila. Our next presenter is Doug Pritchard, followed by Valerie Endicott, followed by Anjali Gar. 
Uh, Doug, thank you for joining us. You have five minutes and please ensure the microphone's on. Good afternoon, counselors. My name is Doug Pritchard and I've lived in Ward 19 for 35 years. I'm 75 years old, living on a fixed income, and I strongly support the proposed budget's tax increase. For the past several years, as other deputants have noticed, noted, there have been zero or very minimal tax increases. And as a result, we've seen the city crumbling all around us. Overflowing garbage cans, closed washrooms, people living in tents, roads made of potholes and utility cuts. We're rich, but our city is shabby. I trained as a chemical engineer, and I worked in the fossil fuel sector for many years. And at the time, I knew nothing about climate change or greenhouse gases. And when I retired, my kids started handing me things about climate change and saying, Dad, this is really serious. You've got to get informed. You've got to get involved. So I read this stuff and, wow, I didn't know any of this. I had no idea that the present and the future burning of fossil fuels was damaging our climate uh, and our city so much. And in response, I've done what I can. I've reduced in my own household my use of natural gas and electricity by over 50%. And I've used my bicycle and transit a lot more than I did before. But it's not just on me. I'm encouraged that the city recognizes the seriousness as well. And that this council and the previous ones have unanimously declared a climate emergency back in 2019. It is an emergency. And we've seen huge and costly floods and torrential rainstorms in the city of Toronto, which have cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. Last summer, I couldn't go outside for two or three days because of the wildfire smoke aggravated by climate change coming down from northern Quebec. And last month, I had breakfast on my deck for the first time in a December in my life. And the insurance company industry has noticed uh, these costs as well. And every year I see the cost of my household insurance going up and up. The City of Toronto's Transform TO net zero strategy is a good one. The proposed budget supports this strategy in several important areas. And I'm pleased that city staff have recommended improved TTC service while keeping our transit fares uh, at zero increase for the coming year. And they also recommend the staffing of critical climate change programs within the city, such as uh, measuring the emissions of greenhouse gases from buildings. And I use my bike every day, summer and winter, for doing my own shopping, for recreation, for visiting my grandchildren. And it's appalling that for years, Scarborough had no bike lanes at all. And the bike lanes that were finally installed on Birchmount and Pharmacy Avenues were ripped out soon after. Scarborough deserves better. And speaking of which, as others have noted today, the proposed budget makes no mention of a busway to replace the worn out Scarborough RT line. It's not fair, nor is it good for the climate. People are standing much longer in the cold, waiting for buses, and then they face a long commute in a crowded environment. So some people are opting for cars instead adding to the city's congestion and pollution. And while the city's net zero strategy is a good one, the spending has not kept pace with the needs. And we're falling behind on our total greenhouse gas emissions compared to our targets. And we're missing out on the job opportunities um, and the investment opportunities in the green economy. And the feds and the province need to do their part as well, and I'm talking to them as well. So in conclusion, counselors, I have cancer. And I may not live to, see, to 2040 when a city aims to reach net zero. But my grandchildren, my six kids' grandchildren, will likely be alive. And they'll be asking whether I and whether you did all that we could for a livable planet. And that's why I support this tax increase. And I'm asking you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. There's lots of jazz hands happening up there. Um, questions to the deputant? No? Okay, seeing none. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our next deputant is Valerie Endicott 
followed by Anjali Gar, followed by Claire Portula. Do we have Valerie online? How very grateful I am that we are finally considering increasing property taxes here in Toronto. I understand that the tax increase amounts to $26 to $35 per month for the average property owner. That's something many of us can absorb, and if we cannot, there are exemptions, and that's very important. Toronto cannot climb out of the $1.78 billion hole alone, but we are beginning to put our money where our mouth is. We are beginning to lead by example and press the other levels of government to help us do all the good and necessary things that we must. An overall good and necessary thing that we must do is make Toronto ready to be at net zero carbon emissions by 2040, as Doug just um, relayed to you. Our Transform TO plan is world class in its aspirations, but it's nowhere near at the scale of implementation that it needs to be. It is long past time that the process of decarbonizing our city be done in earnest, and I am hopeful that this budget is a start. Luckily, this decarbonizing process dovetails well with other good and necessary things. For example, in building new affordable housing, we can make sure that the housing is ready for a healthy future using renewable energy. For example, geothermal uh, heat sources instead of fossil gas that's bad for our health and our environment. And I'm really happy that this council has greenlit a project here in Scarborough at Eglinton and Kennedy that plans to do just that. It's incorporating many other health, healthful and climate friendly amenities as well. Community gardens, greenhouses that help with uh, food security, a tree canopy and proximity to TDC. A further example of a good and necessary thing is investing in public transport. Transform T T TO actually envisions a free TTC by 2040. Free public transport that is well serviced makes life better for ordinary people and better for the environment at the same time. This year's proposed budget in freezing fares and increasing services is starting to point us in the right direction. Although, as many have mentioned today, the lack of the promised busway is, is something I don't understand why it has not been prioritized. I am certainly glad to see that there is a proposed freezing of the police budget. I would support diverting more of these funds and has some of the money go towards paying for the busway in, a, in addition to, of course, the crisis support and other related services. The city must ensure funding that educates the public about all the co-benefits of ensuring social equity and addressing climate safety at the same time. The uh, Toronto Environmental Alliance finds the newly released budget documents from the Environment and Climate Division show Toronto tracking on a business as planned scenario that, quote, to quote them, falls embarrassingly short of the commitments Council has made to addressing the climate emergency and reaching net zero by 2040. In fact, the Environment and Climate Briefing Note number eight indicates that the city is at risk of falling short of even the business as planned trajectory. And failing to address these emission gaps, it goes on to say, before it grows larger, risks the city's progress towards our goals. It implies greater costs and potential stranded fossil fuel res reliant assets down the road if sharp emission reductions are required to make up for lost time. So in other words, it's better to do it now uh, and we will save money later. This uh, admission in this briefing note is alarming and there doesn't seem to be any specific mitigation put forward and that's also alarming. The city needs a publicly accessible dashboard for tracking and reporting on its transformed TO goals. One hopeful development in, in the reports from Environment and Climate is the much anticipated Building Emissions Performance Standard Bylaw, the EPS. It needs to be passed now and implemented without delay. And I'm really heartened that this budget has allotted staffing to make that happen. This brings me back to my hope that Toronto's beginning to take our biggest emissions problem seriously like buildings. Buildings account for 60% of them. Regulations such as the EPS are key, but so is the need for a climate lens everywhere all at once. All the decisions about how best to use our public funds must be viewed through this lens. 
And I think this is the intention of the new carbon accountability system. It needs to be fully embraced throughout all departments. I feel more confident now than I have in many years that it's beginning to happen. And I just hope it's not already too late. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none. I just have one quick question. I just wanted to draw your attention on the 2024 Toronto Budget website. There is a tab for briefing notes. And I just wanted to know, because I have to phrase it as a question to you, if you were aware that there is a carbon inventory department by department, which is the first step towards our carbon budget and accountability system. Yes, I am aware. That's that's the system that I was referring to that I'm feeling hopeful that this uh, current council is really taking, you know, taking that seriously and that the going forward, um, you know, we'll see um, more solid efforts in that regard because I've um, been involved in, in trying to, um, you know, educate about Transform TO for some years now and it's, one of the big problems is that, uh, you know, in the depart various departments, this this critical need of addressing the climate emergency gets lost. So I'm really hopeful that that's not going to happen anymore, and and that everybody will uh, attend to their carbon the carbon budget. Okay, so you're aware then that this was the first baseline. So every year going forward, we will need to report on our GHGs department by department. And that will also start to be linked with dollars. Yes. Great. Okay, thank I'm you. Very happy um, about that. Any additional <laughs> questions yeah. of the deputy? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us, Valerie. Our next speaker is Anjali Gar, followed by Claire Portula, followed by Walid Kogali. Do we have Anjali online? Hello, everyone. I'm here. Hi, Anjali. Thank you. You have five minutes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Anjali. I'm the youth manager at Malvern Family Resource Center. Uh, we're an essential and entrusted hub uh, in North Scarborough that connects, engages, and takes collaborative action in supporting our communities to thrive. I wanted to take a moment to highlight some of the positive impacts that the youth hubs uh, in Empringham and Danzig have made on the community. Last year, we were fortunate enough to receive funding from the city to launch these hubs. They're open Monday to Friday from three to seven and are a safe space for youth to go after school. Their impact has been immeasurable. Although there are so many positive things that came from the youth hubs, I would like to highlight a few for you today. Food security has been at the forefront of everyone's minds lately and youth are no exception to that. Through the youth hubs, we've been able to provide safe and reliable food programs to support both youth's physical and mental health and give them the confidence and skills to be able to prepare healthy and cost-effective meals for themselves. We have also been able to provide a safe and reliable space for youth within their own communities, ensuring that they have the opportunity to just be themselves and thrive without fear. Youth learn valuable career and social skills because we have the resources and space to foster them. We have been able to employ community members to facilitate the youth hubs in their own neighborhoods and have increased resident-led programming to build autonomy within the communities and to encourage the communities to advocate for their needs. That has been the biggest impact that has come through these youth hubs is seeing the community rally around the Danzig and Empringham hubs. It's been so powerful um, and a really great demonstration of their dedication to their youth and illustrates how needed these spaces are. It's our hope that the City of Toronto continues to support youth spaces across the city, uh, including these two spaces that MFRC animates. It's hard to put into words how important these spaces have been for our youth over the years, uh, sorry, over last year, and the communities that love them, but we're really hoping to continue that work. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions for the deputant? Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Morley. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali, for joining us today and for speaking to the great work that you are doing in the community. Uh, I just wondered if you could advise us whether you all have resources allocated for this work to continue in the 2024 budget, um, and if not, if there's a specific uh, funding ask. Um, we're, I, I think for the youth hubs, you know, the amount that we have received um, in 2023, we've been able to do some really great work with that funding. 
Um, there is no additional funding to continue that work. So we're hoping that in order to keep up the resources within those communities that the city would be able to provide uh, the same amount for us to continue some of that great work. That's wonderful. And uh, my colleagues advise that there might be some dollars allocated. So um, I'd encourage you to follow up offline just to confirm. Um, and I just really wanted to echo the important work that happens in hubs like the ones uh, that you are supporting. And we certainly need to see lots more of them in our city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there additional questions for the deputant? Okay, and I will say that we asked uh, through the budget process that if the funding, the, the motion last year that brought forward your funding was intended to be multi-year and we have asked and confirmed that it is included in the base budget and we'll continue to watch that as the budget moves from budget committee to the mayor's budget to final approvals by council on February 14th. So I have to make it a question. So I just wanted to know, um, and I think your answer is no, but were you aware that that was in the base budget? <laughs> no, but that's really great to hear. Thank you. <laughs> and I think you do know also though that um, as, another as another question that my general strategy is to under promise and over deliver. <laughs> and I think you know that that is uh, one of my common, common uh, phrases. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for your deputation. And thank you also, um, this, this funding came about because um, residents from both the Danzig and the Emperingham communities came to council and gave deputations. And I think it just underscores why the deputations that are here happening right now are important. And would you agree with that? Because I have to make it a question. 100% yes. Um, again, like the community has been so much more vocal uh, about their needs because they spoke at the deputations last year. They saw change happen from that. Um, and now they're advocating so much more in their own communities. We see uh, leaders in the communities mentoring the younger ones, uh, especially through our resident-led programming. Um, they're doing a great job at shaping the future of, of the communities, and we're so excited to see uh, what's in store. Great. Okay, thank you for deputing today and for your great work in the community. Any additional questions, the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our next speaker is Claire Pertula. Um, do we have Claire online? Hi, Claire. Hi there. Thanks for joining us. You have five minutes. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Claire. I'm the Food Justice Projects Coordinator at Malvern Family Resource Center. Um, and I'm here to talk about the impact that community farms on public land can have on food insecurity in Toronto um, with minimal cost to the city. Like a few people have mentioned today, um, cost of living is really high and food insecurity and poverty are huge issues in this city. Um, recognizing that that might take a lot of money to address. Um, there are options for addressing neighborhood food insecurity without quite as much funding. Um, from the city. So Malvern Urban Farm is a two acre community farm in the Finch Hydro Corridor in Northeast Scarborough. Um, Malvern Family Resource Center runs this farm in agreement with the city and Hydro One. This year we grew more than 40,000 pounds of food, which was sold and donated throughout the community. Although the project has no monetary impact um, on the city's budget, it is invaluable in its ability to aid our community by providing additional means for food security. Um, MFRC seeks funding from various charitable organizations to fund the expenses that the farm incurs um, and provides infrastructure and support to the community farmers. In exchange, these community farmers earn extra income, grow food for themselves and provide food to others, which helps to mitigate food insecurity in Toronto. Many funders are interested in the work that we do and we could increase our yields and impact if given the space to do so. Many other organizations are all interested in pursuing similar farm projects following our model. One way that the city could support this work is to actively engage with and push the province and Hydro One to release land in hydro corridors and other marginal spaces and to look at city owned land as well um, and partner with community organizations for more food growing initiatives. Um, it's our hope that the city will see the value in these spaces and provide communities with the opportunity to grow. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for joining us, Claire. 
Our next speaker is Wiley, Walid Kogali, followed by Kate Mills, followed by Meiju Cheng, and then followed by Paul Nito Zitsku. And that will take us to the end, and then I'll just do a call on those that were missing earlier. So up right now is Walid. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, esteemed members of the Budget Committee and fellow residents of Toronto. I stand before you today at the Scarborough Civic Centre, not just as a resident of Regent Park, but as a voice uh, for communities across Toronto, where potential for transformation hinges on the city's investments in social development plans. In 2023, Regent Park, my home, achieved a remarkable feat zero gun-related deaths. This milestone confirmed by Toronto Police Services didn't occur in a vacuum. It's the direct result of a $2.5 million investment by the city over the past five years. An investment that wasn't just monetary, but one of faith in our community's ability to redefine its narrative. A crucial component of this success story is the allocation of half a million dollars annually through the Regent Park Social Development Plan. This funding paired with the active engagement of residents and community members has forged more effective, equitable, and sustainable outcomes. It's a vivid demonstration of how fortifying the social fabric of a community leads to enhanced public safety and social cohesion. This is not just a Regent Park story. It's a Toronto story, a narrative of hope and possibility. Yet amidst this backdrop of success, we face a disconcerting request, an additional $20 million for the Toronto Police Services operating budget. This request comes at a time of significant federal and provincial investments in policing and during an economic downturn affecting all levels of government. The question we face is one of sustainability and priority. Are we allocating our resources in a way that builds our communities from the ground up? Are we continuing in a cycle that has not yielded the results we so deeply desire? Investing in social development is not just a feel-good policy. It's a proven strategy for nurturing safer, more inclusive communities, in contrast, excessive funding in areas like incarceration has often failed to address the core needs of our communities. The current city budget overlooks this critical need for investments in social development. This oversight is not just a missed opportunity, it's a call to action for us all. The Regent Park story is a testament to what can be achieved when investments are channeled into the heart of communities. It's a model that can be replicated across Toronto, transforming not only physical spaces, but lives. As you deliberate, as a budget committee, on the allocation for this year's budget, I urge you to consider the transformative power of investing in social development plans. Let's not just build more buildings, let's build stronger, safer, and more cohesive communities. And I want to encourage members of uh, the public who are not aware of the Social Development Plan to visit the city's own website where you can find out more about social development plans. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to share the Regent, Star Regent Park story with you. Um, and thank you for deliberating over the budget uh, and getting input from the members of the public. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kate Mills, followed by Miju Sheng, followed by Paul Nidozitsky. Do we have Kate Mills online? Hi, Kate. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Hello, my name is Kate Mills, and I have lived in East York for the past 10 years and in Toronto for 20 years in Paul Fletcher's riding in a condo with my husband and two children. This is my first deputation. I'm a full-time parent currently, 
but previously I worked at the University of Toronto at the MBA school in marketing. I'm here because I feel scared about the effects of climate change for my children and myself, and I support City of Toronto funding climate programs and an increase on our property taxes as proposed by this budget that will help pay for these programs. Just this September, I joined the climate group for our kids Toronto and through them Toronto East residents for renewable energy, also known as TARE, because I'm so worried about climate change. I really appreciated Paula Fletcher being one of the speakers at the TARE rally that happened in the fall to protest the retrofitting of the Portland Energy Center. For the past six years, I've also been a volunteer for the Three Hours Ambassador City of Toronto program in my building and know how city climate programs can help divert waste and decrease greenhouse gas output. Although we live in the East End, my husband drives to work in the West End. He's been doing this for the last two years and he would prefer to take transit, but the frequency of buses on his route isn't enough to make his compute, sorry, his commute shorter by TTC. I would like to point out that I also worry about him driving on the highway and he has been in one fender bender so far because the traffic is so congested. A new saying in our house is Toronto is an hour away from Toronto. Increased investment in the TTC would make my husband's commute to work faster, safer and far less polluting. Not only that, but as someone who doesn't have regular access to a car and does a lot of walking slash TTCing in my neighborhood, I notice that car exhaust smell daily. I'm not only worried about how this affects the environment, but how this affects the health of myself, my husband and my children. Increased investment in bike lanes and the TTC are so worth it to decrease air pollution that contributes to climate change and create fresher air in our city. Thank you all so much for listening to me. Thank you to Mayor Olivia Chow, Councillor Paul Fletcher, and all the city councillors who are proposing this budget, which overall I can tell will make Toronto not only better for the environment, but better for the people like me and my family and my neighbours and community who live here. I just want to repeat that I support the increase on property tax. I want to stress how important the City of Toronto climate programs are for now with less air pollution and our future. Some services infrastructure that we don't even think of as climate related have huge impacts on our carbon footprint because carbon is forever. We need the obvious climate programs and we need the TTC improvements and we need to improve heating cooling of buildings in the city. I urge you to be bold and lead the way for cities across North America and pass this budget with climate programs funded. I also want to make a quick shout out to the free online program from here in Toronto called Talk Climate to Me. It gave me all the information I needed to understand the climate crisis and get active. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you for joining us. Our next presenter is Meiju Cheng, followed by Paul Nidozitsko. Do we have Meiju in the room? Online? Okay, um, next is Paul Nidozitsko, and then I will do a call of the three people that um, weren't there earlier in case they're online again. Good afternoon. Thank you. You have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, first, I have to give you credit. Councillor McAlvey, after the fourth time you pronounce my last name better than I did after 13 years. I'll keep working on it. <laughs> um, full transparency and disclosure. Uh, I'm a former City of Scarborough construction inspector for design and construction. Uh, I've lived in Scarborough most of my life. Uh, we moved to Vermont and Drive when I was four years old after my parents were expropriated from their home on Brock Avenue, just south of Bloor Collegiate. Um, we were they were expropriated by a school board in the city of Toronto to build a football stadium. Ironically, Bloor Collegiate no longer exists and I don't know what the status is of this football stadium because I don't think it's a sport that's played anymore. And on the site of Bloor Collegiate is a 
condo development taking form. Anyways, um, I've been involved in building infrastructure, housing and developments across southern Ontario my entire life. And I see what's going on in our city and I cringe. We, well thankfully, I guess what's a good thing right now is finally all levels of government have acknowledged we are experiencing unprecedented housing affordability crisis. Took a number of years for that to be realized and acknowledged. Secondly, we are experiencing unprecedented food and housing insecurity. And it's not just in Toronto. It's in every major city around the world. And I'd like to draw your attention. Um, Leilani Farha from the United Nation, former Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing, gave a brilliant presentation to the Planning and Growth Committee back in April of 2019. I encourage all of you to review it on the YouTube archive. She called out the financialization of housing in Toronto, and it's astounding. I see it happening in our community of Cliffcrest with all the condo developments. Our former councillor went MIA during COVID and our city was flooded with development applications. And I suspect that was because they were all trying to get their applications in and approve prior to uh, the city mandate of uh, inclusionary zoning, which thanks to Doug Ford, it's no longer a threat for them. They got what they wanted. I've worked with all the prominent developers that Doug Ford is good friends with. All the developers that are now building in Toronto. There was a saying, and, and, and the area I worked in was not only Toronto, but east along the north shoreline of Lake Ontario. And you know, I, I was a former construction inspector, but I became the contracts administrator for the Cernus Group, major consulting firm. And then I was, uh, finished my career as a project coordinator for the Caitlin Group. And developers were held to account because they weren't allowed to build or get their applications approved unless the infrastructure that was adequate to support their proposals was in place first. And they did this through development agreements they had to put the money up front in order to build the infrastructure. Once the infrastructure was in place, then they got the green light to build, unlike Toronto. We're building vertical cities in the sky with no regard to existing infrastructure, okay? And we all know that developers, my former work colleagues, they don't build affordable housing. Their main goal is to is to the highest return on investment. Now I've really gotten off topic because I'm here to help you guys. I have faith in city council because you've got some young councillors and we have some seasoned councillors that disappeared when I came here. Um, I watch the YouTube meetings. I see the empathy, the compassion, but you've got a pie this big but you need 10 pies to satisfy all the wants. Final thoughts. Yeah. I think Olivia Chow should set a guiding principle that prioritizes spending based on the immediate threat to life. Anything that's an expenditure that does not somehow preserve life or protect life and public safety, all those other wants Put a moratorium on them for one or two years. They're valid concerns, valid wants, but there's only so much of the pie to go around. And there's this misconception that uh, homeowners by default are millionaires. We're not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your deputation. Uh, don't run any questions. Uh, Deputy Mayor Morley. 
Thank you, Paul. Uh, and I, you're, you're just getting into some great guidance for us, so I just wanted to ask if you had any other gems to drop on us, any other suggestions uh, as we navigate this very difficult budget season. Just wanted to give you a couple more minutes. In case yeah, you yeah, I, I do, but I don't think this is the forum for it. Um, I'm currently engaged with discussions with um, Joanna Hazelton from Municipal Licensing. Uh, in full transparency, my wife and I are home sharing ho hosts on the Airbnb platform. We've been doing that for 10 years. Uh, we use that income uh, to supplement our limited pension because we have no benefits, period. Um, and I sustained a life altering injury seven years ago. And even if I wanted to go out and get gainful employment, I can't because of this. So uh, we, we live within our means. And, and all I want to say is I have faith in people. I have faith in this council, okay, because you're bright people. I may not agree with some of your agendas, especially some of the green ones, because I've worked in land development, and I know we got to be realistic. we still got to build. Now, uh, one thing you're asking me, I always took pride in working in the land development industry, but something that's really unsettling for me is what's called predatory developers. That's troublesome. And when I see what's happening on Kingston Road, we're using terms like modernization, revitalization, and really, that's not what it is. It's the intentional target a vulnerable population, namely senior citizens, those on ODSP, low income, people that have mental health issues, uh, and you name it, the gamut is huge. But we are intentionally facilitating the predatory takeover of what's deemed underdeveloped properties, building the luxury condos, and displacing those people from their homes. And I will suggest that is contributing directly to our homeless population on the street. Thank you so much, okay? Paul. Thank you. Appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Any additional questions for the deputant? Um, I will say I was comforted. I thought Deputy Mayor Morley's question was going to be if I was seasoned or young. So I'm, I'm glad. I don't really want to know the answer. Okay. Uh, so the last call for uh, deputants, we'll go back through the list of the ones that um, weren't there when we called them. So last call for Santosh Gupta online in the room. Okay. Last call for Phil Potton in the room online. Okay, and last call for Meiju Chang online in the room. Okay, I will confirm with clerks that completes the deputations for this afternoon. Uh, thank you everybody for coming out today to share your thoughts with us. Very much appreciated that uh, you gave, uh, you spent that time with us today. Um, this meeting now officially adjourns. The meeting at six o'clock is a new meeting. Um, that will start fresh, um, but we'll have the same run of show, so to speak. So with that, I will move adjournment. Oh, I have to take a motion. Okay, that the budget subcommittee received the public presentations on the 2024 capital and operating budgets for information. All those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. Does that complete our business? That completes our business, um, and the next meeting resumes at 6 o'clock. Thank you.